All right, thank you, everybody. My name is Brent Moudy. I'm the global, tech, global Director for Design Technology within IBI. And previously, I was the Global Technology Leader for BIM at CH2M Hill for just over a decade. So I'm going to talk about building civil information modeling and the similarities and differences when focusing on civil-based projects versus building specific projects. First slide, I'd like to just remember a colleague of mine, Jane Alden, who suddenly passed just over a month ago. But she was my inspiration from a civil BIM perspective. And some of those quotes were things that she used to say to me. And my favorite was, you can do, you can do BIM for more than just buildings. And civil BIM is essentially turning BIM on its side. And that was something that stuck with me a long time, is just turning BIM on its side and what that means. We were in Atlanta once on, um, on Stone Mountain, which is basically a rock protrusion in the ground. And we were looking around and we kept saying, you know what, we can bim those trees, we can bim these rocks, we can bim this whole mountain. And the profound nature of that concept that all the items were there were nothing but assets. They were assets particular to the mountain and no different than me walking around this room saying we can bim the tables, bim the columns, bim the walls. So I worked with her for a decade, focusing on data interoperability and lifecycle data management. We were both on the London Olympics, looking at how the buildings and the infrastructure and the utilities and the transport networks all collided with each other and, and fed information to the GIS database, which was consumed by the public. And it was a phenomenal effort and really opened my eyes to civil BIM. So she said to me, let's tell the world about this BIM cookbook. So I thought about this idea a couple years ago, saying, you know, we all talk about BIM, and how do we rationalize this? BIM is something to so many different people. I've seen definitions like you can't imagine. So I said, let's think about, let's think about food. And my clicker stopped working. There we go. Oops, let me go back. Sorry about that. So BIM can be thought of as a cookbook. And I said, if we rationalize it from that perspective, Recipes are within a cookbook, and recipes have various ingredients. You put all those recipes together, and you achieve something. I love cooking, so I thought the analogy makes a lot of sense. But then with the cookbook, you've got all sorts of recipes. Good ones, bad ones, old ones, digital ones, the hand sketch from your grandmother from 100 years ago, etc. How do they all come together? And when you look at BIM and you think, well, there's different ways, different ingredients, different assemblies of solutions. Some are good, some are not. Some are efficient. Some are those you're forced to do, but would probably never want to do again. So then I said, well, let's look a little more on ingredients. And let's not talk about software. Let's talk about some of the things that I would do with BIM. So internally to management, I kind of make these buckets. And I divide everything on the left is what I want to do. And that one little bucket on the right is what we have to do. So looking at what we want to do, internal to CH2M Hill and now to IBI, I filled out all these sub buckets, which I grayed out because they're acronyms and it would be, I would be here all day just talking about that. But the idea is look at design BIM. And what would I want to do with the BIM model during design? Is it a building project, a civil project, a plant project? What are the assets of importance as I term them? What do owners want to achieve out of my model? What do we want to achieve personally? Looking at life cycle, so that's my design into construction, into operations, the owner's information, as the UK calls it, employer information requirements. What are the reasons why we're doing BIM? Who are my consumers and what do they want out of my model? And then of course selling BIM, instances like here, we've done projects, we've done work, what have we done, what has worked, what hasn't? Then there's the technical minutia. And there's various sub buckets within this field and you know, we have to train, and there's various means of training. We have our own uh, preferred approaches internally, but you got to discover what they are, virtual or in class. 2D CAD coordination. There's really AutoCAD and MicroStation out there. We normally have to deliver to something coming from our various BIM authoring softwares. Enterprise coordination. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Every single time you decide how to do something, scattered across your organization. If it's a small organization, that's a lot easier. I, CH2M Hill was 25,000 employees. IBI is 2,500. 
No different. They are vast organizations, and the focus on enterprise-wide synergy is a critical part of my everyday work. Tool configuration. The more tools you use, the more you configure. The more that needs to be configured, you have to manage licensing approaches, data sets, uh, interoperability questions, workflows. What does all of that mean? It all has to be managed. Each one of those bubbles are a full-time job. We had the collaboration panel this morning. Heavy focus on that. Forget about whatever tool you're using. You still got to collaborate. You have to connect with others, both internally, throughout a joint venture, with your owner, with a DB partner, externally to stakeholders. And the last one is operational coordination. That's the non-tangible, the people side. Um, how do you build your champions? How do you build stewardship on your projects? How do you ensure quality and accountability and build that regime within the organization to support BIM? Nothing to do with software. It's all about the people. So a good BIM recipe for success for me, has an equal portion of all these pieces of the pie. So that operational, so what we call internally geographic sector and corporate leadership. They don't have to know the in-depths about BIM, but they have to know what is BIM, why are we doing it, why are we spending money on this technology, both from a tangible and intangible perspective. Why are we training our people? Why are we training our project managers? Why are we engaging our clients? The collaboration piece is a huge piece. Find that common data environment as termed by BS 1192. Do we have a single source of truth or as single a source as possible? When we have multiple systems, how do they speak? How do we move data from one common environment to another? And that was a heavy focus in the UK. A lot of agencies have their own data for the published content and we're developing data in a different system. Resources, your people, your hardware, your software. Project BIM lead is an important one for me. That's my single point of accountability for all things BIM on a project. They don't have to know everything, but they're that go-to person. They're embedded in the project. They're shepherding whatever the BIM goals are. They're shepherding the approaches, and they're reaching out to the contacts and the networking and the technical resources to help achieve it and make it happen. Training is training. Make sure people can do what we expect them to do. Awareness, that's just understanding at the project level and at the corporate level why we're doing what we're doing. And there's a lot of effort just in that alone. And then lastly, scoping the project. So we, I've heard BIM execution man plan mentioned quite a bit today. Very critical. So from a BIM execution perspective, I said, let's look at this wheel of BIM. I call it a wheel. I look at all of these as generic terms for the BIM goals defined in the Penn State plan. And when I say every project that, that the firms I work for, every project is BIM. That's an interesting statement because oftentimes when I say BIM, people say, oh, are you sharing data with your owner's asset management system? Well, no, maybe not on project A, but maybe on project X. Doesn't matter. That central column, there's always a model to produce our drawings, and we're doing some type of design and constructability review. So those are very, what I call, simple BIM goals, yet BIM nonetheless. Everything on the left and right are goals to be discussed, analyzed, value propositioned. Do they fit for a specific project? So visualization comes up a lot. Oh, you have a model, can I get a picture? Sure, I'm gonna press print screen. Save that JPEG and here's the picture. Oh, no, no, I want to have lights and materials and shadows and ray tracing and maybe some animations and, well, that's a whole different type of visualization. So one visualization is a couple seconds, the other one could be a couple of weeks. So it's planning and scoping the goal. How do we intend to do it? What's the purpose for the audience and the delivery? I, I spent quite a bit of time looking at speci specifications in the last couple of years, and that's that ability to query the model look for specific element classes, and then feed some type of a project specification system. So Bentley has a tool called SpecWave. Uh, Revit links to a tool called eSpecs. And the idea there is, again, scope it. What am I going to work with? So my work with plant data in the past, I would use the model to scan for valves or pipes or pumps, for example. So it found those classes, it would list the types of components and go ahead and edit a master spec. Similar concept for, let's say, doors. Scan the model for the component called door, look at the type of door, the particulars of it, go find corresponding master specs, and do a bit of editing for me. Great way to get this concept of single push button, give me my specs. 
Fabrication is an interesting one as well. Happens a lot on the civil BIM side where you're feeding your intelligent model into some type of a database engine to either you know, remote control the um, uh, excavation, for example, to understand where the utilities are, to have areas of do not disturb. So some impressive elements that can be done there. Just want to quickly touch on cost estimating because I just came from the cost estimating one. BIM doesn't do your cost estimate, and that's something I say all the time. I list it as cost estimating because that's the, the general perception, but BIM can give you quantities or content to support cost estimating. Same way BIM won't design my building for me. The last one I'll touch on, they're all important, but operations and asset management. It's a critical one now. More and more owners are drinking the BIM Kool-Aid, if you will. So RFP requirements that used to be give me a PDF file, mold it into give me a CAD file. Now it's either give me BIM, and you've got to try to figure out what that means, or it's give me your BIM files and also give me a list of these specific components. And for those components, I want these specific fields of data. And it starts to get really robust and in-depth with respect to what is being sought for either inclusion into an asset management system like Maximo or something of that nature, or just for the potential of inclusion, and you have to deliver it. Then Jane, my colleague, came along and said, let me take your BIM wheel and turn it into a little more civil focused. So she expanded a little bit on it, but exactly the same concept. So there's no one right answer. The point is scoping is critical. Am I going to take my BIM model and have a goal focused specifically on machine control and hope to be able to drive our excavation machines on site based on content pulled in from the BIM model? If so, that sounds pretty awesome, but we better know how we're going to do that. The model better account for that as early as possible, and somebody better be testing that, that project BIM lead, better be ensuring that throughout the duration of the project, it's being set up to actually facilitate such an item. So now I've got all these ingredients. Now we'll talk software, because software, you can't avoid it. You need software to do BIM. I like dividing the fact that software comes with building, civil, and plant-based tools. And most of the vendors are in alignment with that, your Autodesk, Bentley, Intergraph, et cetera. So what I've seen in the last decade or so is, well, I want the project to be Revit. Sounds good. So can you do my terrain modeling in Revit? And I'd say, well, there's a terrain button, but is that really a civil engineering tool? Or can you do my plant piping in Revit? Well, there's a, there's a place pipe button. Same with Bentley's EcoSim. There's a place pipe button. Really good for domestic plumbing. Not so good for plant-based um, industrial piping. So, and the reason for that is the linkages to the analytical tool. So on the civil side, you've got your kept fill analysis. You can do stratification of site layers. When I was on the Panama Canal, they were extremely interested in knowing what are the various layers of the, of the earth and how much basalt content is in existence at a certain depth in the canal range so that when they're starting to dig for the lock system, they can account for that accordingly. And for me, like being an architect by trade, I thought, Okay, that's rather obscure, but it was quite important and it would have saved millions as they discovered where, where those basalt deposits were. On the plant side, linking to pipe stress analysis tools and intelligent P&ID schematics is a very critical piece that is important to plant operators. So I mention that because in the realm of whether I'm doing BIM for buildings, BIM for civil, or BIM for plant, selecting that right tool is important. Now, I'll argue there's never a project that does only one of those three. Almost every project will do at least two of those three. And I'll say, unless your item is floating in the sky or um, floating, floating on the sea, you have to have some type of civil interface. Once you've selected your tools, though, I like to wrap it in the platform. Now, this is where I get bogged down with my computer's too slow, what are my line weights for the CAD standards, all those wonderful things. Iron those out, standardize them. In the world of BIM, I don't really like talking about do I need five different line weights, ten different line weights, how do it should all be ironed out. And you will not please everybody, that, that goes without saying. 
but it has to be set. Same with the hardware. If we're, if we're taxing out the systems, well, I guess we've got to look at the systems, but that's got to be set because I want to wrap that platform around my BIM tools and put focus where I believe the BIM focus should be, and that's where's my data going. So I've got all that stuff set. Is my owner asking for the PDFs? Is my owner asking for model? Is my owner asking for specific data? Where else is the data going? So projects in the US, the DOTs, Departments of Transportation, have very specific requirements for civil data turnover. Most of them will have some type of a state plane GIS system set up. Maybe in a tool like Esri, they're gonna wanna pull in data from your civil model, whether it's Bentley's uh, Open Roads, Auto AutoCAD Civil 3D and you, they'll have a definition of what data they want. You've got to make sure that that data is queryable and able to be turned over to meet their needs. So how do you do that? And that's the BIM execution planning. Not about line weights, computers, and horsepower, and IT connectivity. Settle all that stuff. This is what I want to focus on. And this is where I've spent the last eight, nine years of my career, trying to understand what owners want and how to get it there. So talking about civil specifically, I remember I said to my colleague Jane, this was about eight years ago, so what's the deal, right? What's the big deal with civil? So she put this together for me. We were working on the Olympics, and this is based on Bentley's inroads. She said, Brent, it's not just about a terrain model. Because when I came from in the architectural world, got all the building, that's where all the fun stuff is, and it sits on some land. That's all. It's, it's there. As I said in Revit, press the terrain button. Ecosim, press the terrain button. There's my terrain. Make it look pretty. Add some sidewalk. I did my architectural thing. She said, no, it's a whole lot more than that. So everything is civil, is database driven. You enter content based on what, at that time, Inroads called it a pay item database. Every element was classified. Now, if you look at BIM tools today, whether it's building civil or plant, similar concept is there. I argue today it's harder to model unintelligently than it was many, many years ago. Because if I go into any tool and I say, you know what, I want to place a door, but don't call it a door. I'm not even sure how to do that in Revit because it's a door, or how to do that in Ecosim. If I go into a plant tool and say place a pipe, but I don't want it to be called a pipe. Same thing over here. If I'm placing layers of the terrain, it forces me to call it that. If I'm placing site assets, I have to say, is it an embankment? Is it a, a um, park bench? Whatever the case is, I have to actually identify these items from databases housed within the civil tools, place them in. I can't make a civil 3D surface without it being a civil 3D surface. So automatically, there's some enriched embedded data that allows me to generate more and more information from that. I, I queried my civil users. I said, give me an example of data. And this was one item I got. And I said, well, OK, so tell me what this is. And it was cut and fill options, not just the cut and fill data from the model, but the options of the cut and fill data based on optional surfaces placed inside the model. So it was showing the changes from existing to new based on what do we got there, four options push button out of, this was out of, um, I believe it was Inroads 8.5, if I remember correctly. From this information, you got linkage of any and any of the civil applications can go to and from a GIS database. And again, that's critical because tools like Esri are looking for specific data types and finding them. So then I step back and I say, so let's talk about civil BIM. What exactly does that mean different from building or plant? Still got drawings, right? Drawings and plans, they come out. Plans are a little cooler because you got plan and profile. And I think I never had a real full understanding for this until I started running and I pulled up Google Earth and I said, I want to see where I'm running. And then Google Earth said, do you want to see your profile? Then all of a sudden I was able to see the profile of my run relative to the plan. I said, well, that's pretty cool. And that's exactly what we have here. Virtual built form, so 3D coordination. This is a doc. So they were doing a port dock, a, um, a port project with uh, forklifts and docking and moving, moving of crates and items from the ships to a storage location. So all of the issues that would be inside a building are here scattered horizontally across the civil infrastructure. 
Drainage, utilities, and grading, very heavy, and I would argue on every single project we do. So I put a building on a site, it's got to interact with the utilities that serve the building, and the water, you know, the, the architect's greatest thing, that water better drain away from my building or I'm going to have water infiltration, whether you're doing a house, whether you're doing a high-rise, similar issue. Existing and new infrastructure. I love this one here, so there's the existing, and here's the new. Notice at the center of there, there's your building. Your building BIM is that piece. Overlay it with the surface. Your civil BIM is all the stuff around that little box that's your building BIM. So my colleagues who are in the civil industry love to point that out to me, that there's so much, the, the breadth of what civil covers is, is far grander at times than what the building covers. Roadway interchanges. Vast networks of movement, vast networks of structure, bridges, roads, stratifications, layers of, layers of different type of dirt and gravel and drainage and utilities, all working in harmony. Roundabout designs, ton of those in the UK, some here too. Rail network design, and my favorite, laser scanning, or, that, or any type of... Uh, uh, point cloud existing modeling, either for as-built or for understanding existing conditions. They become so advanced now with respect to what you can do with respect to point clouds, and this is just a huge, huge technology that a lot of firms are jumping on. So a couple of projects that IBI has worked on. For me, the bridge. The bridge is your typical example of turning BIM on its side. It's your horizontal structure. This was um, the LaSalle Causeway Bridge designed in 1912 in Calgary, and it had some horrible record documents. So the client said, BIM it for me. And we said, with what? Let's get a bridge tool. So we've got, we could use Tecla, we could use Leap. They said, no, no, BIM is Revit, Revit is BIM. Okay. So BIM, we went into Revit and we said, let's model this to the best of our abilities. We did model right down to the, we used Revit right down to the rivets. And it was an intense project, a level of detail that I would guess we probably wouldn't pursue but it made for quite an intriguing model and it's a record. And because we were able to divide the heavy detail from the lighter detail, you're able to actually navigate the model if you don't want to get into that, that immense detail. And the client has a record of the bridge, which they can do whatever they want with now. The James Street GO station here in Hamilton, uh, 50 million for Metrolinx. So Revit and Civil 3D were the tools. BIM was commenced during design, pushed into construction. We had what I call the, quote, simpler BIM goals. So this was, I, would, I don't want to say one of the first BIM, but it was one of the first full multidiscipline BIM that IBI pursued. Um, clash detection was immensely critical. And I didn't talk about clash detection on the wheel because I knew I was coming here uh, to this slide. Um, there's two ways. There's automated clash and then there's what I call manual or soft clash. So you press the button, you get the list of clashes, you analyze, you mitigate accordingly. The biggest misconception is this all these softwares will identify and fix those clashes. So not true. But with that said, it'll identify some good ones. So if I want to do a clash of a structural model against a structural model, it's probably not a good idea because I don't want to know where columns in, are sitting on beams and where beams are sitting on footings because that's probably all as designed. I remember in a previous project it would show, it showed me thousands of clashes where all the handrail was clashing with the, with the um, concrete slab because the handrail was embedded in the slab and we didn't want to go and puncture the two inch holes all over the place. So, you know, there, some clashes are just ridiculous. But there's other clashes like structural against mechanical, mechanical against architectural. Find those ducts that are hitting those beams, automated reports, fix them. It's pretty awesome. The soft clashes are the most critical. So where are my clashes where maybe a pier is clashing with the right of way of the train? So maybe the pier is a little too close to the tracks. Maybe there is a column in the vicinity of a handicap entry or barrier free entrance uh, or pa access to entrance to a doorway or a stairwell or an elevator. Those clashes are probably even more critical and addressing those are often done either through reserved spaces or through visual walkthroughs. 
But the synergy here, this was for me a lot of fusion here between building and civil. Because again, notice, there's the building in the distance. It's a pretty intense building, but look at everything else around it. The building is useless if the train isn't going under it in the right location, and there isn't proper access for the pedestrians to come up, the movement of the go buses to bring the people, to move them through the turnstiles, the electronic linkage of the station to the overall go network as an asset in the overall system. All of that stuff is far more important to the success of the project as a whole. In Kitchener, we had a streetscape project for King Street. And why I like it, it's a pretty simple project, but this concept of, let's talk about the BIM ecosystem. So the assets were pretty simple. Park benches, waste baskets, a little bit of road repair, repave, et cetera. Yet, they all form part of a larger asset um, ecosystem, if you will. And the idea was, let's look at what happens to those assets. So you go, you field verify, you design, you approve it, you construct it, you verify it post-design and reintegrate it into the system. And you can continue that cycle over and over and over again through that asset's life cycle. And it will have influence on other assets' life cycles. So it's a very important concept, and effort was put into ensuring that there was that understanding. Civil 3D model, pretty simple, with relatively flat design, elements and assets were modeled, and then we, some visualizations were generated with some of the specific assets identified, vegetation, planters, trees, receptacles, etc., and it was able to be tracked and added to the overall system. So here's a project that I think is awesome BIM that never had a BIM model, and I think that's pretty cool. So here's doing BIM with no Revit, no Ecosim, no Civil 3D, nothing. Our intelligence sector has built some tools to harness data for life cycle. So 16,000 kilometers of roadway for highway, the highways agency in the UK. Develop them a dashboard to analyze their systems, to analyze their assets, to understand where their components are, their maintenance schedules, pull in their information along with asset-specific information, whether it's aerial photos, Google Earth mapping, or some base mapping that was developed. So our team would go and identify various assets, analyze them, catalog their condition, feed it back into the system, and all of the information was geospatially located along the 16,000 kilometers of network. This phrase here, how the model was created, is completely not relevant as opposed to what data is required and why. So we were able to feed a schematic that in essence, what we call it route mapper, that's in essence a quasi 2D CAD file, if you will, or a GIS database essentially that was built internally to manage and govern the information and geospatially located across the network. They have 64 defined asset types. So this is where, from a BIM perspective, if I said, how do I scope this? I would go to the owner and say, tell me your employer information requirements in UK terms. They would tell me about these 64 assets. So we would define those as the main asset classes. And then I'd start to ask, what do you want to know about this stuff? And why? And where do you want to see it? And then we would design that in what we call this route map reviewer, integrates where we are in the physical realm to where that resides in the GIS viewer, looking at those specific assets, tagging them, cataloging them, and portraying them. We're able to also take some um, uh, point cloud scanning of the existing infrastructure and track that, again, geospatially located within the route mapping tool back to the, um, in, within the database. And of course, over time, we keep enhancing it, so now we have the view where I can see through my real-time space geospatially located in the route mapping tool, as well as identifying any more, um, the better looking point cloud or the more accurate and in-depth point clouds. So this, this system, mobile access, field access, accessible from their main headquarters, gives them real-time asset tracking throughout the life cycles of the assets. And not of the project, because the 16,000 kilometers of road hopefully will live for a very long time, but the assets themselves have varying life cycles that either collide or interact or are just completely unique throughout, um, throughout the management cycles. The last thing I want to talk about 
So this is looking at subdivision control. This is in, an internally developed tool that IBI has built called Arch Control, and there's the website for it. And the idea here was an interface to come to analyze the, the, the progress of construction specific to architectural materials. So again here, this is BIM modeling software irrelevant. So it can be fed from anything, 2D PDFs, a 3D Revit model, an ecosim, an I model for, with ecosim data. It really doesn't matter and we really don't care. This is an online repository, repository for architectural material information. That's the purpose of it. So the clients who come here, they want to see their subdivision. They want to understand how it's divided. So our land development team does the design. They understand how the areas are parceled. Every parcel has an asset tag. Every parcel will have content built on it. And then that content in itself will have an asset tag and a unique identifier. So in the, um, in the FM session earlier this morning, that was the critical piece. Don't make your models and drawings full of information you don't know during design. The unique identification is what's critical. And knowing that the information in arch control is going to be specific to what, we're, what the clients are desiring, we're able to ensure that those identifiers are there in the design, design packages. Drawings and models can be linked, so we bring in, as I said, PDFs, live CAD files, live BIM models. I'm working with this team now to see how, how good of a back and forth we can do with tools like Revit or with tools like uh, Ecosim, where we would actually have the architectural design. Operational data is included in the database, fed in by the client themselves. So we offer the, sy the system as a service, the client accesses it, feeds in their, their maintenance information accordingly. And we're able to then track what's been developed, what's been installed, who are the manufacturers, what's on time, what's not, et cetera. So I have two and a half minutes left. This is my last slide. With all of that said, I want to dwell a bit on collaboration because this, uh, this is an important topic for me, regardless of where you are in design, in construction, building models, using any of the authoring tools, whatever your cookbook is with all your various recipes, this collaboration piece is the utmost criticality in my opinion. Um, I use WIP shared and published as this is what the BS 1192 has um, the only thing that's actually enforced. It doesn't care how you model and author your content. It, want, it cares how you're sharing as well. On the Olympics, the London Olympics, we talked a lot about this. Published content, for me, that's the easiest. I have a tender set, 100%. I have a record drawing set, whatever the case is. A model for 30, 60, 90. It's a static snapshot. It's locked in time, and it's turned over for delivery. That's my published content. Use whatever tool is possible for that. There are so many out there. People say to me, you can use something as simple as Dropbox, something as complex as whatever. Shared is a little more complex. So shared, I have a Revit central model. I have an Ecosim file. I have a smart plant model. I have a Civil 3D file. And I want people to now look at it and review. So I can put it into a format like Navigator, Navisworks, um, IFCs to view in Salibri or Tecla and get some comments, mitigate the comments, and send it back. That's OK. There's a little lesser set of tools that can do that effectively. WIP is the hardest. Work in progress. I have a Revit Central model, and I want everyone in this room 